coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap. The backronym vulnerability hits the web. Actually, it hits MySQL right in the SSL protection. We'll tell you all about it. The hacker group that went after Apple and Microsoft intensifies their attacks. And a new survey shows that many core Linux utilities might be at risk. Then it's a great batch of your questions, our answers, our rock and roundup, and much, much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 224 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on July 16th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by our three fine sponsors, DigitalOcean, Ting, and IX Systems. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this year's show goes on. Our live stream, while that's powered by Scale Engine. Go over to scaleengine.com to go check that out. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher. Well, it's Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hello, sir. So, guess what today, Alan? Huge show. What's that? Huge show. It's a big show today. Uh, we have so many things to get into that uh, we uh, we were kind of like almost like wondering if we should try to rearrange some of this stuff to try to make it all fit. But, no, <laughs> yep. it's, you know, it's one of these things where a lot of things in the TechSnap wheelhouse have developed over the last week, and it's perfect for us mm -hmm. to cover it. So, we're going to just dig in. Um, and where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the uh, with this uh, this uh, 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 um, back with this new background in vulnerability? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so as we've seen, uh, the trend now with vulnerabilities is to give them a, a, a cool name. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes, it's kind of a stretched backronym, mm -hmm. right? So with a regular acronym, what you're doing is, you know, uh, the first letter from each word in something spells out the name, right? Like NASA. Um, <clears throat> so the backronym is where you come up with the word ahead of time. Uh, if you, you come up with the word, the acronym first, and then you try to make words that would make that acronym. Hmm. And sometimes some of those can be stretching it a little bit. Like we saw the uh, RC4 no more last week was mm -hmm. like RC4 numerous occurrence uh, m monitoring and recovery or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know they had to take two letters from the word recovery to make it to spell more or whatever. Um, and they can be stretching a little bit. Uh, but these guys went so far as to actually be meta by having their backronym be the word backronym. That's pretty awesome. I love it. Uh, yeah, so the backronym vulnerability, uh, which horrifically <laughs> um, stands for... Uh, it is bad authentication. Bad authentication yeah. causes critical risk over networks. Yikes, MySQL. And of course, critical spelled with a K. Yes, because backronym has a K in it. <laughs> so yes, bad authentication causes critical risk over networks. Yikes, MySQL. Uh, so this comes from the researchers at Duo Security, which make one of the popular two-factor authentication tokens uh, software and so on. Mm. Uh, but basically they found that when you um, are making a connection for SSL, specifically uh, from PHP, but in other cases too, mm -hmm. um, the client will request SSL and the server's supposed to do it, but if the server doesn't, then the client just accepts that anyway, even though the client was told to require SSL. Now, on the server side, you can say, don't ever make a connection without SSL, but if somebody's sitting as the attacker in the middle, in that case, they can make a connection to the server with SSL. Uh, so, so the user, the victim, is trying to connect to your server, and you are set to make sure only ever do it with SSL because they're going to have access to passwords or something, so they never should be able to submit in plain text. But the attacker in the middle can accept, intercept that connection because it's not SSL, mm -hmm. right, from the client. Right. Or they can pretend to be the server and just pretend not to support SSL, and the client will make the connection anyway. Then their software in the middle can make an SSL connection back to the real server. So the server will think it's actually talking SSL and it'll be fine. Oh, man. It's, but basically, the client isn't properly enforcing when you ask for SSL. It should give an error if it can't do SSL instead of connecting anyway. Sounds like something the NSA would love. Yeah. Uh, well, even worse, Oracle's had a fix for this for a while, uh, over a year, mm. and they've committed it to MySQL 5.7, but 5.7 hasn't actually been released yet. Everybody's still using 5.6, yeah, okay. which they've never bothered to patch. Lovely. So almost everybody out there is using a version of MySQL, MariaDB, or uh, Percona, or whatever version of SQL uh -huh. uh, that has this vulnerability. Oof. Oof. Yeah. So there's no patch uh, yet, and it's out in the wild. Uh, well, 
Oracle has a patch, uh, well, but yeah. only for the other version. Yeah. So I'm 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 sure very quickly that patch will get ported over, uh, and at least MariaDB and Percona and so on will have it. Uh, but it really goes to show that Oracle's kind of uh, being a bad uh, open source citizen with the whole not patching stuff in in the open source versions of MySQL very quickly and so on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now, uh, but basically, this is. Uh, Equivalent to SSL strip. So basically it would allow someone to take the SSL security out of a connection between a client and an SQL yeah, server. Okay. All right. Now, uh, the researchers point out that in most cases, uh, the connection between the website or whatever and the database is either going to be on the same physical machine or over a private network. You Not very often do you actually make secure SSL, uh, SQL connections over the internet. Yeah. Uh, but when you do, you definitely want the SSL part. And so this is kind of a big deal. Mm-hmm. You know, I like that. I mean, the, someone in the uh, man in the middle could get everything. Not only just your user, the using the big thing is they get the username and password and connect to the database and then access whatever they want, however yeah. they want. Yeah. Uh, but they can also basically decrypt uh, or cause you not to encrypt, really. Right. Uh, everything sent from the server back to the client. Right. Uh, did you see their their website is backronym.fail? That's the URL <laughs> to find out more. And uh, know that they got the dot .fail. That's that's, that's a awesome, nice right? Time. They have a three step plan. Uh, step one is uh, panic. I mean, just look at the logo. Your database is going to explode. Step two is tell your friends about Backronym. Use your thought leadership talents to write a blog post about Backronym to reap sweet internet karma. Leverage your efforts in responding to Backronym to build up political capital with executives in your organization. And make sure your parents know it's not safe to shop until Backronym is eradicated. And then step three, actually remediate the vulnerability in any of your affected MySQL client side libraries, also MariaDB and Percona. Unfortunately, there's no patchback ported yet to MySQL 5.72. So if you're on MySQL 5.6, like 99.99% of the internet, you're basically out of luck. <laughs> Backporting yeah, security fixes is hard, apparently, they conclude. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, if you're on CentOS 6, you're probably on MySQL 5.1 still. Mm. Uh, but I do like the fact that, um, you know, they, they were meta with the backronym and, they're doing, and then their uh, four-step process there is definitely uh, spelling out you know, the fact that they find this whole doing vulnerability analysis this way a little ridiculous. A little distasteful. And, you know, they're right about people using it for political capital and all of that. Like, it, it, it's yeah. just... Uh, specifically, be like, oh, we patched the what's a who's it vulnerability. Yeah. Uh, we respond to that in so one day and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, yeah. Which yeah, is, like, good. Like, like, you want them to get the accolades for that. But then, like, at the same time, it's like, you don't want it to be... Well, you don't want to job. be <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And you don't want to be gamed either. It's a serious problem. It's a difficult one. But yes, uh, uh, it's, it's nice to see more people riffing on this. Um, and, and I understand having a, a cool name for the vulnerability makes it easier to talk about it mm-hmm. rather than, you know, CVE uh, 2015, 4421, and 4422. Like the two for the Java exploit. So I don't even know which one's which, but if they, they had names, that would help. But at the same point, we have 10,000 plus vulnerabilities a year. We're not going to have cool, we're not going to, it's not possible to have cool names for all of them. Uh, and the other problem is that, you know. Is that a challenge, if, Alan? If the, <laughs> if, if the point of the, uh, the names on them is more for marketing to sell whatever, you know, to promote the company that found the vulnerability, yeah. it's the wrong point. Uh, it, it, you know, the point is that we want to be able to communicate about very high impact vulnerabilities. Right. Uh, but the point is to talk about the vulnerability, not the people that found it. Yeah, well, yeah, and that's that's where it gets so frustrating is when you can smell that it's more about more about the people and less about informing. Uh, interesting. Any other thoughts on that? Uh, I, I'm still laughing about their steps. I know. I think we're gonna <laughs> have. A, I think we're gonna have kind of like. A, there's a roundup story that kind of ties in a little bit. I can't remember what it was. Not why I'm saying that now, but I can't uh, remember. But separately, um, PHP has released new versions of oh, yeah. uh, all supported versions of PHP <coughs> okay. that fix the backronym flaw on from the PHP MySQL client side. Okay, good. Uh, so that critical. should definitely help. Yeah, that's a bit critical. Uh, isn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, getting that PHP patch installed will mean that it can't happen. Uh, from PHP initiated connections. Right. Although, if you have some other app that tell, uh, covers it, then right. Uh, okay, Alan, very good. Thank you, sir. Good, good breakdown on that one, and kind of a fun one. And one, it's 
What I, what I kind of love about that is the meta-meta story there is it's something you and I have been commenting on. I think before a lot of other people really kind of started picking up on the trend, like we started going like, what's going on here, like a while ago. And so now it's just now people are just making total commentary on it out in the public, and I think it's kind of awesome. I want to tell you about something else that's awesome. Guess what? It's DigitalOcean. Head over to DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code SNAPOcean to get a $10 credit because you're going to want to try out DigitalOcean. It's simple cloud hosting, and they're dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to get started on a, on a server up in their cloud. And I love that they have an HTML5 console from post all the way up to boot, so you can just do it right there in your web browser. You don't have, you don't have to have the Java or the Flash or whatever else they might come, come ActiveX control. No, it's just nice. They actually, they wrote it in Go, and it works really, really well. And here's something that's pretty slick about DigitalOcean. You can get started super fast. Over 500,000 developers have deployed applications on their cloud, and they got started in less than 55 seconds. And the pricing plans start at only $5 a month. That's less than one trip to the fast food or coffee shop in a week. Like, <clears throat> I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I got Thai food the other night, and it was like $30. I mean, I think about that in terms of DigitalOcean droplets. That is amazing. And it's $5 <laughs> a month. And you, for $5 a month, you get 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. So I've set up like own cloud and BitTorrent sync, and I have a Minecraft server up there. And those are just some of the more recent ones. And I'm always using it like for temporary FTP because they have hourly pricing as well. And they have data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, Germany, and London. So when you're traveling or if you're based in one of those locations, there's going to be something close to you if you want to do global distribution. Yeah. That's nice. And people have asked on TechSnap before, oh, what's a good service for me to set up a backup mail server? It's yeah. like, well, for five dollars, you can't really argue. Yeah, <laughs> really. Using DigitalOcean for that, yeah. and, it's, and uh, you know, I did it for a status website because yeah. you know, if if our website's ever down, we need a place to post messages really, and five direct dollars? people to. That's that's a, exactly. and it's and it performs so good too. It performs so so good. Uh, and here's the other thing that's really really nice about DigitalOcean that kind of keeps me keep going back to do more and more deployments is like my Linux on demand infrastructure service is I really like their control panel. Uh, it's really easy to build a new droplet, and I can I can set something up with Ubuntu 14.04 and Docker on there in like a, just a matter of seconds, or something with Fedora and Nginx in a matter of seconds. And it's really intuitive. It's very straightforward. But then you can replicate all of that functionality with their really nice API. They iterated it a couple of months ago, and the community has just been loving this API because it's gorgeous. And so there's a bunch of apps for your phone, for your desktops. I don't care what OS you're running. And it's check check your distro repo, check your AUR, check the ports tree. There's stuff in there for DigitalOcean because the community is writing around this API. And there's a bunch of great stuff to like snap it into Puppet or whatever else you might have, or just write a bash script around the thing. DigitalOcean.com. Remember though, you got to use our promo code SnapOcean. You can apply it to your account. You get a ten dollar credit. Even if you forget when you first sign up, you can go back and apply it to SnapOcean. It'll give you a ten dollar credit. Try out that five dollar rig two months, or try out a more powerful rig. It's really really cool. They're also hiring. They have positions open, so you can check out their War hiring page. And they're also taking submissions for technical write-ups. So if you're a technical writer, mm -hmm. consider it. I, I think it's uh, they're in a really, really good position right now. They just got a new round of funding, so they're starting a whole new chapter. Uh, kind of amazing, Alan. They just closed $83 million in funding. Nice. So DigitalOcean's got some runway. And uh, they're going to be around for a while, and they're doing a really good job at it. So check them out, and they're hiring. And uh, you can go to play a droplet over there and use our promo code SNAPOcean. You support the show and get a $10 credit. DigitalOcean.com. Thanks, DigitalOcean. OK, so the hacking group, or the hacking team, I guess it's called, mm -hmm. right? Hacking team or whatever. So yes. arrogant. Uh, more and more stuff coming out from this all the time. This time, uh, this article is coming from IT. Or so no, this one's different. Oh, not this hacking This is a different team? group. Yes. Okay. Yes, this is just a hacking group. OK. <laughs> I was wasn't sure because, you know, ah, it's so generic. Yes. Yeah. I know it's horrible that they did that. Uh, so yeah, the group that originally hit uh, Twitter, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft back in like 2013 oh, yeah. or 2012 even, yeah, yeah. and uh, I think it's 45 companies in total they hit. Uh, they kind of went dormant after that, uh, but they appear to be back now. Right. This is uh, the butterfly group, right? This or Symantec um, calls them. Kaspersky calls them wild neutron, yes. and Symantec calls them Morpheo. Right, and then some, Morpho. And, and Morpho, and somebody called somebody called yeah. There's like yeah, they got several names. Yeah, yeah. neutron was yeah. the Kaspersky one. I remember that. I remember that. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, and so after the 2013 attacks against Twitter, Facebook, Apple, and so on, uh, the group kind of went underground and temporarily halted activities. Uh, but yeah, Butterfly is technically proficient and well resourced. The group. Uh, has developed a suite of custom malware tools capable of attacking both Windows and Apple computers mm. and appears to have uh, used at least one zero-day vulnerability in its attacks. It keeps a low profile and maintains a uh, good operational security, uh, so it's harder for the antivirus people to track them down. Yeah. After successfully compromised at a target organization, it cleans up after itself before moving on to its next target. Smart. 
you know, their higher end, their goal is to get in, get what they want, and get out without setting off the alarm. Don't be cocky. Don't be some, showy. Right. Whereas some of them, you know, if you're, if the point of breaking into the thing is to deface the f- page of Twitter or whatever, then you're obviously going to get found out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if your goal is to get in there, get some specific stuff, and then get out, it'll be different. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't remember. I wonder if this is the team that compromised the um, the forum that Apple and yes, Facebook and so on used is. to communicate yep. about uh, making iOS and Android apps. In and fact, so on. I, I might have stashed that in the notes uh, before we started because yeah. I think it is. I, I went back and tried to grab it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, the OS 10. <laughs> pint sized or whatever it is. That's that. Guy. They're the ones that we got like the Facebook developers and uh, whatnot. Yep. Good right. Memory, it, it was uh, one of the big forums. Well, I think because. I was semi-related to some of that stuff happening. But anyway, uh, I remember covering it on TechSnap a while ago. Because it was, you know, it was like, because uh, Facebook actually was the first to find out about it because the network security they have in their offices was so high. They were like, a bunch of our developers' laptops are all now trying to do things they shouldn't be doing. Hmm, and yeah. that's how uh, anybody, you know, no, none of the developers even knew they had gotten infected from the forum. Right. Because uh, the forum basically is a legitimate site, but it got compromised, and then they injected the, a zero-day Java exploit, yes. I think it was. Yep. Uh, and so it hit all the developers. It was uh, quite a good strategy, honestly. Mm-hmm. It's basically a great example of a watering hole attack. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so the malware was used in these attacks. Even has uh, Mac OS X backdoor, uh, and then subsequent analysis by researchers also found a Windows backdoor hmm. uh, that they used in different attacks. And so it was one of the ones that actually had a. Um, it would detect what OS you were and decide which payload to hit you with. Uh, Symantec has uh, to date discovered 49 different organizations in more than 20 countries that have been attacked by the group Uh, they've also shown interest in uh, commodity sectors including uh, attacking two major companies involved in gold and oil Uh, they also attacked the central Asian offices of a global law firm Wow! uh, because I'm sure they had lots of information about that kind of stuff Hmm. Uh, specifically that company specializes in finance and natural resources Mm -hmm. so Having knowing where the next big oil well is going to be found or the next gold mine or Good whatever, competitive advantage. all that kind of stuff is very useful. It's also data you can sell to a competitor for a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, Butterfly has also developed a number of its own hacking tools. Uh, HackTool.SecureTunnel is a modified version of OpenSSH, which contains additional code to pass a command and control server address and a port uh, to a compromised computer. Uh, they also have uh, HackTool.BS. Bannerjack, uh, which is retrieve default messages issued by you know Telnet, HTTP, and other TCP services. Uh, Symantec believes it is used to locate any potentially vulnerable servers on a local network. So mm. when they infect a computer in a network, it starts scanning uh, and looking at the banner messages of every open port on every machine inside the firewall. Yeah. So the firewall would normally block port scanning, but once they compromise a secretary's computer with a, a phishing attack or something, they can then, oh, look, there's a Telnet port open on this router, and it's this known vulnerable version of, of the Microtik OS or whatever. And then they can, you know, they have all these extra vectors to attack. Uh, they also have HackTool.EventLog that parses the event log on Windows and dumps out hmm. any ones that are of interest to them hmm. and can delete the entries. Oh. So they, they can clean up behind themselves this way. So they can go they purge can also, selected entries from the event log? Yeah. They can also kill processes and perform secure deletes where they will overwrite so that the data can't be recovered. They also have hack tool that proxy A is used to create a proxy connection that allows attackers to route traffic through an intermediate node. So because a firewall won't let any outside connections in, I've compromised the secretary's computer. I can make the secretary make a connection out to yeah. my command and control server sure. that I can come back in through so I can connect to that router. Yeah. I remember building one of these in high school. <laughs> yeah. I, I ran it on the I, – I, I convinced the school to let me do it under false pretenses. Uh and basically, we set up a server for this remote access Trojan in, that I've written in the math office. And it was set up, I, I told the teachers that, that it needed it. But the teachers had a basic control panel to control all the computers in the lab that I had written. Yeah. Uh, and they could you know, take a screenshot of the screen and see what was to monitor what students were doing. Uh, because if they get up and walk around, when they come near, the, everything gets minimized. And they're like, what were they doing? Yeah, right? It's very suspicious. With the screenshot, it, was, it worked. Uh, but yeah, I convinced them it needed a server thing, and that what that server did was reverse tunnel to my house so I could control computers from home. Nice. I set up something similar when I was in school. <laughs> that's that's yep. very funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's that concept is, you know, if you can't make connections in, have someone inside make a connection out for you. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, but based on the profile of the victim and the type of information targeted by the attackers, Symantec believes that Butterfly is financially motivated. They're looking to steal information that they can sell or use to make money. Uh, the group appears to be agnostic about the nationality of its targets. They're not, you know, targeting any one country or avoiding any one country. They're just uh, going out to make as much money as they can. Hmm. Maybe a hackers uh, for hire potentially too. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, Symantec has their blog where they talk about Morpho, the profit, uh, profiting high-level corporation attacks. Uh, they also have their uh, a separate paper about the secure tunnel tool yeah. that we just talked about. Yeah. And then uh, over on SecureList, which is uh, Kaspersky's site, they have Wild Neutron, economic espionage threat actor. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, returns with a whole bag of new tricks. Yeah, they're they're people are getting they, these guys are watching these and getting excited. And it's interesting to see, but uh, you know what's what's what is interesting is both Kaspersky and Semantic are recognizing they're returning to activity around the same time too. They both picked it up, so that kind of gives it some more credence that it's it's really they really are kind of back in action. Yep. Huh. All right, Al. Any thoughts on I that? I think it's, it's possible that they were never actually offline. That's what I was thinking, just, too. Very discreet. You know, they're like, we've, we've got way too much heat on us right now. Let's yeah. be less quieter and just collect some yeah. stuff. Or, or they had lots of money after all that, and they, now they need more money. Maybe. My bet is, yeah, they probably just went under the radar for a while. Because if you think about it, probably nine times out of ten, they go undetected if they're doing a good job. Exactly. You know, and they're, they're just after making some money. And then... Um, if you can use information to make money and people don't know that you stole something and sold mm-hmm, it because mm-hmm. you only sold a copy, mm-hmm. uh, well, if, if if nobody even knows that you got it, it's very hard to get caught. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. Well, I'll tell you about something else that's cool. That's Ting. Go to techsnap.ting.com. That's the next sponsor of the TechSnap program. Techsnap.ting.com. That's going to give you $25 off your first Ting device or if you have a Ting compatible device and they have a large GSM and CDMA network. They give you $25 in service credit. That paid for more than my first month. So go to techsnap.ting.com. Ting is mobile. It makes sense. I love Ting because they're on a mission to finally clean up the U.S. mobile industry because it is a freaking mess. We essentially have a duopoly in the United States of America, and these two companies charge you outrageous amounts for text messages, for data, and calls. You'd think that every SMS that comes to your phone was wrapped in gold. You'd think every minute that you spent on your phone was a silver packet, and every data is like... I don't know, plutonium. I mean, it's unbelievable how much they charge for these things. Ting is pay for what you use. They just take your minutes, your messages, your megabytes. They add them up, whatever bucket you fall into. That's all you have to pay. There's no contract, and therefore there's no early termination fee. You own your phone. It's unlocked. Now, if you're outside the U.S., this isn't sounding totally crazy to you. This sounds like totally normal and exactly the way it should be because customers should be treated with respect. That's probably what you're thinking if you're outside the U.S. And if you're inside the U.S., you're thinking, oh, phones are shiny and I like to get them subsidized, so I'll get myself in a contract. And then you do that for a few years and you realize that didn't really work out so well, did it? And how's that customer service? Because Ting has no hold customer service. You call them at one 855 ftw and a real person between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. East Coast time answers the phone. And they have a killer dashboard, so you don't even really need that if you don't want to. I never have. Uh, here's what I'd like to, to suggest you do. If you hear me talk about Ting and you think that maybe it's too good to be true, go to techsnap.ting.com and check and click that how much would you save, techsnap.ting.com. And then when you go in there, put in your actual usage. You know, how much your minutes used, how many tax messages you received, your megabytes, and what your bill was before taxes. Run your calculation and see how much you would save over the lifetime of the contract you have from a duopoly. Just check it out, techsnap.ting.com. Go there and see what your savings would be, because when it's only $6 for the line and the phone's unlocked, if you can bring your own, that's going to be a phenomenal savings. If you have a small team or even a medium team, like here we have like, you know, six lines we use. I could never afford that on one of the traditional duopoly carriers. Yeah. It's just not feasible, and it makes it so much easier when we're on location. You know, I, so I, I can call back here. It really is great. And, you know, I love everything about Ting. I love the no contracts. I love the customer service. I love the fact that it's paid for what you use. And what I think would be even more amazing is if we had more Ting in other areas of our life, like on the Internet. How about as an ISP? Well, Ting is working on fiber Internet services, and they have an update on the Ting fiber rollout. Let's see what it is. Mm. Nicholas K. asks, for internet, are you more likely to expand outward from Charlottesville or step into cities in different parts of the country? I think that we're more likely in Charlottesville just to focus on the existing city area for the time being. You know, we think there's so much opportunity inside the city itself uh, and there's a lot of different places we can go with the network and that's what we're really focusing on there for the time being in Charlottesville. Uh, at the same time, we want to 
really expand into new markets in the U.S. So while we're doing that in Charlottesville, you'll see us looking to get into new cities across the U.S. as well. TechSnap.ting.com. I'd love to see them roll out more. And they have uh, great information up on their blog. If you ever want to check it out, just go there first by going to techsnap.ting.com. Get yourself a great phone. They have, I, I would personally recommend, I think, the best phone on Ting for price. And what you get right now is the Moto G2, the second-gen Moto, Moto G. I mean, there's lots of phones. They got everything up there from the Galaxy S6, which is my personal favorite, down to value phones around $50. But if you want something in the sweet spot, that Moto G second gen is an amazing phone, and you can get it unlocked with no contract and only pay for what you freaking use. And if you got some Wi-Fi up in your business, you're probably not using a lot of mobile data. You could be saving a ton of money. And if you know how to make calls over Wi-Fi too, then you can. Then it gets phenomenal. Then you might be able to get your bill down to levels you never thought were possible with a smartphone. TechSnap.ting.com. And a big thanks to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Alan, this next story makes me shake my head, but it doesn't surprise me too much. It looks like maybe many core tools we rely on under Linux might be vulnerable. What do we know? What's going on here? You're right. uh, so this out? was a, a kind of a study done as part of the core uh, infrastructure initiative to gauge the bus factor of various open source projects. Okay. So that's uh, how much trouble would the uh, project be in if the developer uh, got hit by a bus? Yeah. Uh, we had uh, many interesting discussions about this in the FreeBSD project uh, when there were like 70 of us on the same airplane leaving Malta. <laughs> yeah, if you uh, all died, there'd be a bit of a problem. <laughs> the plane yeah, it's factor. Like seeing here, we got uh, there's there's all the OpenBSD people, and there's all the FreeBSD core team, and and there's all the people from Netflix. And <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so they basically did a study and they published the results over on YouTube. They called it the Census Project. Yeah. Uh, and they kind of identified, uh, they made up a scoring algorithm to decide how many different contributors there are, how often there are contributions, how many people contribute. Uh, so they'd look, if the project doesn't have a website that's up to date, it gets a point. If it has more than four vulnerability CVEs against it in, I think, they use a range of three years or something like that. Uh, then it gets three points. Uh, two points if it has two or three, and one point if it has just one. Uh, obviously, the absence of a CVE doesn't necessarily indicate an absence of vulnerabilities in the application. It just means they haven't been found recently. Yeah, okay, okay. So zero could actually be worse than four. Oh, okay. Uh, contributors, if the 12-month contributor count is zero, the project gets five points, right? Yeah. If nobody has changed anything in a year, it gets five points. Uh, four points if it has on one to three people. Two points if uh, they don't know how many people have contributed. Because sometimes with the way projects work, you can't tell how many actual people were contributing. Uh, then popularity. If the package is in the top 90% 90 uh, 90 of the most popular deving packages, it got a point. Oh. So uh, okay, that's what, okay, I see. If, if it's very popular, it's more of a chance that it's a big deal. Yeah. Uh, then if the project's main language is C or C++, add two points. Uh, mostly because that's where lower level languages like that have more chances of having problems. Mm -hmm. Also, if the package is directly exposed to the network, uh, whether it's a client or a server, then it gets two points. If it's used to process data provided by the network, it gets one point. Uh, and it also gets one point if it typically runs as root via set UID or directly or whatever, uh, or has anything to do where it could have local privilege escalation. And then finally, uh, Application data oh, If the package gets uh, three points taken away, if it only has data and isn't actually like an executable. Okay. Uh, then to tweak that, they also, um, if it has dependencies, uh, if it has more than five dependencies, add another two points. Yeah, the dependency seems like that would be the tricky thing with Linux. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then add one point if it has between one and five dependencies and no points if it doesn't have any uh, okay. dependencies. Okay. This is really uh, fascinating. Patches. If there are patches specific to OS, like a .deb or RPM that's uh, doing local patches that aren't going into the upstream project for some reason, yeah. that's an indicator, right? So if there are more than uh, five patches that aren't upstreamed, then it gets a point, right? Because it means that there's either some disagreement or some problem or basically having local patches like that becomes unmaintainable over time. So the fact that those aren't getting upstreamed is an indicator of a problem. Mm. Because I maybe upstream is dead or whatever, and that's why the patches aren't getting upstream. And then they also uh, added in stats from the ABRT crash statistics service that's part of Linux now. Uh, they get two points uh, if it has uh, the amount of crashes is going up over time. Mm. 
but if it's stable uh but high it gets one point okay and so they amalgamated all that information together and came up with the risk index and um looking at the currently the riskiest program out there is the ftp client really yes uh because um it's got a high popularity it's like 150,000 popularity sure. points yeah sure i bet it um, does yeah right that makes sense and it hasn't had any cbes recently but its contributor count is unknown it seems like possibly nobody's touched it in a while yeah it probably doesn't need a lot of Which changes makes sense yeah yeah. yeah yeah uh but it could have issues uh, i know openbsd found a couple of issues with theirs but their ftp client can also do http and https uh, and a couple other things so like they've kind of it's also their wget basically and so um, I don't know what the surface area in the Linux FTP client is like. It's interesting. A lot of people probably don't use the FTP client for specific downloads, but if you're going to browse the directory and download something, then you would, right? Or maybe the package manager might or some script. Yeah. 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 Uh, the second uh, highest program, obviously, is Netcat okay. itself. Uh, well, this is Netcat-traditional, which is slightly different than newer Netcats, but uh, again, hasn't been touched in a long time, but is installed on a lot of systems. Uh, TCPD. I'm not even sure what that one does. I guess I think it's kind of like INETD. It's just a basic TCP daemon. Uh, the who is command. Mm. That one, uh, especially with all the new TLDs, I suppose it might be possible to that a string parsing or something could have a vulnerability. But basically unmaintained, right? Yeah. Uh, X auth, uh, which I think is a an ident daemon. Uh, the at command. I don't know if most people use that anymore, but it basically is kind of like a cron tab, but it's for scheduling something to happen kind of once off. Yeah. Be like, in an hour, do this. Apparently, libwrap0 uh, is a threat. Hmm. Uh, trace route command. Oh, wow. Um, of course, everybody's got that. Bzip2. Uh, I was actually looking at this because I noticed a bug in the man page, the way it par- uh, shows up on FreeBSD. And I went to upstream it and found that the last release of BZIP2 was from 2006, and it was because of a CVE, and there hasn't been anything done huh. since then. And since if it wasn't for that CVE, there probably wouldn't have been anything for even longer time. Of course, BZIP2 just works, so it's hard to say um, if, it's, if it's really going to be a big problem or not. Hmm. Um, I know on FreeBSD, on our GZIP has got Capsicum support, so if there ever were a bug... The fact that you run it as root wouldn't allow it to it's, do it's, whatever on your system. It's essentially isolated. Partly because when you look at a man page, which is often something you would do as root, um, <laughs> yeah. it, the man pages are gzipped and you're ungzipping them. Mm-hmm. So if somebody could make a malicious man page, then uh, yeah. The worst exploit ever right there. That's awful. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Uh, the hostname command hmm. apparently doesn't change much. I, I would have thought with hostname D that would have got more love. Uh, libacl1, libaudit0, libbzip2, uh, libreadline, uh, libtasn, which is for parsing SSL certificates, so that's kind of a big thing. Uh, Linux base itself, uh, no CVEs, but not uh, hard to tell how many contributors it has and stuff. The telnet command, uh, the telnet command in FreeBSD has had a couple of patches over the last 10 years, uh, even though we've all been using SSH for a long time. Yeah. Uh, you know, there have been vulnerabilities been found in Telnet D. Hmm. No surprise. Uh, LibPam modules has had 14 CVEs and it has only 20 contributors, but it seems like it could be a problem. Uh, XM4 base and XM4 config, uh, W3M, uh, LibPam 0G, uh, rsyslog even. Yeah. I guess the part that I'm still kind of scratching my head at, though, Alan, is it doesn't really seem like they've successfully measured, as you put it, the bus factor in this study. Right. Well, I, I'm not sure that that was really their goal. It was to find, you know, which programs are most in need of attention, are most likely in need of attention to make sure that they don't become the next uh, source of problems for us. Uh, but yeah, the, it turns out the bus factor isn't what they managed to measure very well by looking at contributor count and so on. Partly because I think the contributor count they used uh, seems to be based on all time. So, hmm. you know, you look at something like the ISC DHCP client has 21. And Linux-image, uh, or 3.2.0, which I guess is the kernel, has 13,617 contributors. Yeah, it's, which that's... Which seems like... Yeah. 
That's not a very it's good not measurement. necessarily measuring the right thing. And for a lot of them, they don't seem to be able to get a measure, and that probably is making it hard, right? Even like NTP, they just don't have any data on how many contributors there were, or LSOF, uh, which is a useful tool, or even the less command. Um, but I imagine trying to do the same research on FreeBSD would have a similar problem. It's like, oh, well, we imported less from Linux, so we don't know how many people contributed to it there before we imported it or whatever. Mm -hmm. huh. um, so uh, they're asking for people's help about you know, what other factors you think we should add in here. And it's all up on GitHub so that you can uh, make your own fork of it and look at different factors or change the scoring algorithm to measure what you think is a more useful bit of information. Because currently, you know, they've, uh, the way they score Apache makes it have eight points, whereas BusyBox only has six. Whereas Apache's got a very large group of developers. It has a review team in place. Yeah. It's actively developed. It has a release cycle. Whereas BusyBox is used all over the place, embedded in all kinds of things. But how often does it actually get like, a security audit? And, and you know... BusyBox, like OpenSSL, kind of seems like it's in that situation where it might end up just, you know, a developer gets paid to work on it uh, for X or Y feature, but then when they're done, that's, that's the end of it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There's not actually necessarily a group of maintainers the same way. And so that might be another thing to look at. Hmm. Interesting that they're going to that work, though. So the Linux initiative, or the core infrastructure initiative, is going beyond just funding uh, work, but also going out and trying to do a, a consensus and a survey to try to get an idea of where these weak spots might be. And so it seems like they're kind of taking their mandate and kind of moving forward with it beyond just the basic funding of groups and, and really trying to do some discovery right. here. To actually do some science and figure out which projects need the funding as yeah. well. Which is really uh, what we need. Because especially a lot of these would probably benefit from just, you know, it, it, um, kind of like the FreeBSD Foundation now has a couple of on-staff developers. And if the core uh, infrastructure foundation could just do that, we're yeah. going to take everything on the top, you know, 50 of these applications mm -hmm. and have uh, this guy spend one week going through the code and yeah. just looking for obvious problems. Right. And then it, at the end of a year, he's done these 50 programs well, in his two weeks off. Or and, and I'm sure that's they're going in a direction like that. But actually, in a way, even just this data that we just discussed is actually pretty valuable. Just that right. data is valuable right there. So, But also uh, refining the algorithm so that we can thing, do things like, instead of just looking at the number of dependencies, mm -hmm. what if we look at the score of the dependencies? If you have a bunch of dependencies that are known to be stable, like APR, the Apache Runtime Library, yeah. that's good. But, for example, libAPR util LDAP brings in LDAP, which isn't as well-maintained necessarily. Uh, and so having that kind of affect the score um, and having the, you know, a, a uh, if, if a library is considered risky and it's a dependency of your program, that should make the risk of your program go up. And, and things like that. Absolutely. And, and figuring out more factors that actually uh, are indicators of a problem. And so I think to do that, what we might have to look at is let's look at the last so many kind of big deal uh, updates or vulnerabilities or whatever and figure out kind of the, the root cause maybe. Mm -hmm. what, you know, how, when did this bug get introduced? Right. How long has it been there? You know, some yeah. of them, obviously, yeah. like the um, shell shock one's mm -hmm. been there since the 80s. That's so. what I was just thinking of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like kind of figure out a profile for the type of program that's going to be the source of, of more of these, or more likely to be the source of things like this, mm -hmm. so that we can kind of attune this algorithm to make it do a better job of detecting which applications are going to need the attention. That would be a lot of good insight if we could do that. I like that a lot, Alan. And maybe uh, adjusting the way the popularity is calculated instead of just how many people have this package installed out of the Debian repo, uh, looking at things like, you know, uh, a lot of these, it's like, well, a lot of the packages have the exact same number because it's a package that's included in the base system, so everybody has it. But that doesn't tell us how often it gets used. Right. Or and does it get used in sensitive situations? More data points than just the Debian I'm not sure repo that, would be nice, too. Yeah. Uh, but I also I'm not sure, you know, how you measure that yeah. uh, without privacy concerns. Yeah, yeah. It's like I, I'm going to look at every command that executes on your system <laughs> and keep track of which ones are done yeah. as root. Just so, just send your history just file. Just, could you just on a weekly basis submit your bash history file and uh, we'll review that? Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah probably not a good idea. Yeah. Uh, all right. Any other thoughts on that? 
But check it out on GitHub and uh, see if you can't make that data more useful. Yeah, it is. It's all posted up there, and we have a link to that in the show notes. It's pretty cool. All right, well, then let me tell you about IX Systems. They're pretty cool. Go to ixsystems.com slash text app. No more inaccurate or overinflated quotes. No more poorly built servers. No more missed deadlines. No more frustrations of outsourced tech. That's right. Tech support that is really actually good and knows what they're doing at IX Systems. Salespeople that actually know what they're talking about yes. and engineers that have built the technology that, that you'll be deploying. such a difference. Yes. We're trying to build these servers and we're like well you you quoted these hard drives well what about this drive is it better and it's like well that one's um currently the price per gigabyte on that one is worse but if you really need to fit that much space in one server we can go that way but it's like the downside is we haven't used that one as much currently and uh so we we, we're not a hundred percent uh satisfied but, you know, that we like that drive. They've been around. So if you go to IX Systems website, uh, go to first go to ixsystems.com slash techsnap and then look around on their site. Look at the history here. They have a chart. They've been around for a long time. And so yes. in, in this process, they've become deeply invested in the open source communities, many very important ones. They've become deeply invested in their partnerships with their hardware providers. And they've built a bench of open source developers, contributors, and people who've worked in this industry for as long as there's pretty much been an industry in this area now. Yep. And they really have an unmatched team. It's it's really if you can if you could if you come into an organization and you move them over to IX Systems, you're going to be the secret weapon that company now has. I mean, it really is a totally different experience. They're not going to bail on you when you've deployed an open source solution. IX Systems are open source champions, and they go to community events. They're down at OSCON. They leverage decades of expertise in hardware design and contributions to many out- open source projects like FreeNAS and PCBSD, and they've been innovators in storage solutions in the enterprise for years. That's why Scale Engine uses them. Mm-hmm. IXSystems.com slash TechSnap. Yeah, they're just <coughs> a really good place to get stuff good done. Good people, too. And we, we wouldn't yes. say that. They don't, they, don't tell, they don't pay us to say that. They are really great people, too, mm-hmm. which is really nice. It's, it's good, and it's refreshing. And uh, I feel very confident in recommending uh, that uh, your IT shop use IX Systems. I absolutely would. And if I ever, for some reason, like this podcasting thing doesn't work out and I go back into client services, IX is who I'm always going to recommend because I... I mean, nobody's ever going to get fired for recommending IX. It is really great stuff. And especially if you have a data center somewhere remotely you need to ship to, or if you want to experiment with FreeNAS and you, you hear us talk about ZFS all the time and you want to get a really good ZFS storage array, or I'm sorry, ZFS storage array, you got to go to IX Systems. IXSystems.com slash TechSnap. Now, Alan, I would recommend that people go over to Jupiter Broadcasting right now, and I bet by the time they're watching this or somewhere around episode 224's release, there's going to be a release of BSD Now episode 99, one episode away mm-hmm. from 100. Do you have any precognition of what 99 might be about, Alan? Any kind of... Um, no? Okay. If I open my Google Drive here, yeah, no, right, probably, probably notes already yeah, written. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you probably have already done the interview, too. It's just, uh, wh- how does it all get assembled? Uh, That's- yes. Uh, actually, we have an interview with the GNOME developer talking about how building an automated testing or automatic building of GNOME 3 on FreeBSD oh. in addition to Linux yeah. helped them find bugs that they accidentally introduced in GNOME sooner rather than later. Cool. Because normally they wouldn't hear about the bugs uh, that the fact that they broke GNOME on FreeBSD until later. You know, six months later yeah. when they've done a release and it's then it's been ported. Yeah. But whereas by having it in their continuing integration uh Immediately, it means the developer gets an email within 24 hours saying, hey, mm. you broke that. You should probably not. And uh, other interesting things. It was also our most exciting interview ever because it was inter- interrupted by the fire department. Oh, I heard about that. So this is the one, huh? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. BSD Now, episode 99. Go check it out over jupiterbroadcasting.com. You get more Alan Jude and Chris Moore in your face. Uh, Chris Moore is the guy behind PC BSD, so they make a great mm-hmm. team on a BSD podcast. And uh, if you start that download right now, this is about the halfway point in the TechSnap show, so you can still get your Alan Jude fix when this show wraps up. Just go grab that. I get the HD version over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. But Alan, with the news all done, I mean, it's time for the TechSnap feedback.
Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website or starting a thread in our subreddit over at techsnap.reddit.com, a great way to get insights from our super smart community. Our first email this week comes in from Mr. J. He has a question about a 6-gig SAS. Now, he says, from time to time, I need to quickly copy a large amount of data from one Z pool to another Z pool on a different host using ZFS send and receive. My setup is currently 14 mirrored 7200 RPM SAS drives connected to a 6 gigabit SAS backplane. My same setup... Uh, and then uh, same setup on another host. So he has, identical, he has identical host with an identical setup. I have them both connected over the network via a 10 gigabit switch. I'd like to take advantage of the 10 gig network pipe as much as I can. Is the 6 gig SAS going to be the limiting factor here? Is the bus limited to 6 gigabits or is it a 6 gigabit per drive? Should I focus on trying to remove the storage arrays to 12 gigabit SASs? Thanks, guys. What do you think? Um, there's quite a few factors that are in play here. The fact that there's 7200 RPM... Uh, spinning hard drives likely means you you struggle to actually saturate the six gigabits anyway. Uh, especially because they're mirrored, you'll be able to read fast. But writing, if you have fourteen mirrored drives, I'm I'm assuming you mean you have seven uh, mirror mirrors, groups, or maybe he means fourteen mirror groups. It depends. I, mm. um, if you have a lot of drives like that, uh, more than eight, you might consider just even if twelve gig SAS is a problem or hard to get or whatever two separate 6-gig SAS controllers mm. and put half the disk on each one yeah. and might be able to solve the problem. Um, but in general, there's quite a few bottlenecks and that one, you're mostly going to be good enough, I think. Um, you know, you're never going to quite saturate the whole 10 gigs of your network pipe anyway, but ZFS Send will saturate as much as it can, really. Um, but I think your bottleneck, even if you had the 12 gig SAS, you're not going to get much more than 6 gigs, I think, because of the disks. Mm. Uh, but ZFS will handle that. Like, so it will send the data as fast as it can. And on the receiving side, it will, uh, you know, smack the, it, it batches up the data and writes it out as quick as the drive can take it. So uh, it should be a good stress test to see if you can actually saturate it. Uh, but because of various other factors, you might not be able to get much more than the 6 gigabits anyway, and the SAS backplane might not be your limiting factor. Uh, obviously, 12 gig SAS or two 6 gig SAS controllers might improve it, might not. Um, it's really hard to predict exactly what's going to be the bottleneck in this case. Um, one thing that will really help you, uh, well, he didn't say how he was moving the data, did he? What oh, he does say send and receive. He does yeah. say send and yep. receive. Yep. Um, Upcoming soon, there will be a patch to ZFS Receive to make it prefetch, and this will make oh. ZFS Receive faster. Oh. So currently, the way it works is when you receive, it reads some of the metadata it needs off your disk and then writes out the data. Okay. And then, then it waits to read. So it's waiting for that read all the time. Yeah. With the new way it's going to work, uh, the video talking about it, it will be up on the BSD CAN uh, videos uh, about OpenZFS by Matt Aarons. But uh, basically, it will queue the read say, oh, I need this yeah. bit of metadata in order to calculate the checksum and everything to write this block of data. That's clever. And it'll queue that up and then just keep queuing it. Like, so then it'll move on to the next packet so it can receive even faster. And then in the background, the hard drive can find that data, get it, and, and it'll just get rid of that little latency in each operation. That's going to be nice. That was a bottleneck before. Huh. Uh, so that's not in... Um, I don't think that's in any ZFS yet, but it's it's coming very soon. Coming to a ZFS, uh, or it you. might be. I think it's in Delphix, hmm. uh, not quite an open ZFS yet, but hmm. uh, that will land quite soon, and that will probably make a bigger difference than anything. Hmm. That's really cool. That's going to be a nice uh, performance upgrade just by a software update. Yeah. Um, if you want to go to 12 gig SAS, uh, that works, uh, but. Basically, I wouldn't recommend spending that money unless you're sure that's what the bottleneck's going to be. That, so it's almost going to have to try it and see and figure out where the bottleneck is. Uh, I wouldn't want to spend a whole bunch of money the, on uh, it. The other nice thing about but, going the dual six uh, gig SAS mm -hmm. is that you do get like, like you have some re well, not really redundancy, but you have some well, options. Specifically, you could controller. if because he's doing mirrors. If he puts the first disc of each mirror on one controller and the yeah. second disc on the other controller, yeah. it means that. Um, yeah. If one whole controller goes away, yeah. all of his disks stay online because he only lost half of each mirror. Yeah, and it also I would think would be I think that would be better performing when doing read and write operations, right? Because then probably yep. You would be, be using both channels. Yeah, exactly. So that seems like a pretty great way to go if he can. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. Hmm. Cool. Good question. Uh, and, and, but I don't think the twelve gig SAS controllers are that expensive. Like a regular HBA is 
you know, two four hundred dollars or whatever. So if that's not uh, a big concern, then sure, upgrading the twelve gig SAS might help, or the two six gig SAS depends on, uh, you know, how many PCIe slots you have available yeah. and so on. Yeah, that is that's, um, that's the other thing. And the other obvious advantage with the extra SAS controllers is that means room for more drives later, but most likely your chassis is pretty full. So hmm. um, let me know how it goes, and yeah. uh, if you would like some help with the tuning and stuff, that sounds like a great case study for our advanced ZFS book. Mm. So, You should stop by the uh, irc.geekshed.net Jupiter Broadcasting chat room. Yeah. And uh, find Alan in there. Or email, or email me or whatever. Yep, yep. yep. Uh, you can always email us back, techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. So Oliver yep. writes in, you know, we name drop fail to ban all the time on the show. Long-time yep. listeners have heard us talk about it a lot. He says, hey, guys, since you guys inspire me to always think about security, I've always been kind of searching for things to make our little corporate server more secure. Since SSH is one of our more fundamental tools, I thought about actions besides updating. Maybe I should pick a more secure password, use public key authentication, etc. So I decided to do all that, but now he's moved on now. He's decided to install Fail to Ban, a little tool that detects brute force attacks. With Ubuntu, it was very easy. You just app get install, bail to ban, or fail to ban is what I think he meant to write. Uh, I tried it out, and it works perfectly. But when I checked the log, I had a little surprise. A Chinese server had already gotten banned, and that was just three minutes after installing the software. Wow. Well, it's because fail to ban, when it first starts, will read the history of the log file. And so it found somebody that had been attacking you already. But yes, if, if you don't have something like fail to ban, your server's probably being pounded on by a bunch of people all the time. Yeah. He said, uh, I also, uh, I would like to uh, hear your opinions about fail to ban versus SSH card. I decided to fail, I decided to go with fail to ban since I saw their latest software release was 2014 instead of 2011 for SSH card. You know what I think about any of that? Is SSH card not getting uh, updated I, anymore? I still use SSH card, and I'm sure there was newer updates than that. Maybe it doesn't require a lot of updates know. since it's just reading a log file. It doesn't right. Well, yeah, it's just a pipe of uh, um, yeah. syslog. <coughs> yeah, maybe. And but I think the regexes yeah. might even change more. You would than think that. it would need updates from time to time. <laughs> All right, so we want to help Ryan out, or uh, you ready? You want to keep digging? <laughs> You're digging about yep. it. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry, I was digging. Yeah. <laughs> but All yeah. Right. Um, the advantage to SSH card has seemed a little more flexible what it could do. Uh, it had better support for BSD is why I was using it ah. in one case. Um, the other one I like is denyhost.py. Um, oh. It uses TCP wrappers, oh. which makes it work better in containers for me oh. because my containers can't have a firewall. That makes a lot of uh, sense. But obviously you could also use something like fail to ban on the host and have it uh, also check the logs from inside the containers. Wouldn't the other nice thing about using TCP wrappers be then it's the, that traffic never even gets a chance to bang on the SSH daemon, whereas if you're using fail to ban, it's, is it getting as far as the SSH daemon and then at the log... And then the getting, firewall blocks it, so... With TCP wrappers, um, but is that true with fail to ban, though? An SSH card? Well, fail to ban is going to add it to uh, your firewall, IP tables okay. or IPFW or whatever. Okay. Okay. So the problem with TCP wrappers is that not every, every daemon goes through TCP wrappers. Yeah. Okay, in so fact, newer uh, versions of OpenSSH removed support for TCP wrappers. Oh. oh so, oh. Uh, deny host might not be an option anymore. Yeah, although, I don't know. I think most distros will probably keep the support. I don't know how difficult that'll be, though. Mm. Uh, OpenBSD has a way of pushing their agenda. All right, our last email comes in, Alan. Colo or no go? As a DigitalOcean user, I'm more than happy with my droplet performance. I run a handful of websites, databases, VPNs, and other various servers for the $10 a month version. The only thing I wish I had more of was storage space. I've been looking at upgrading the droplet, but for the amount of space I require, it isn't feasible. Actually, I'm working on I'm working on something for my similar for myself with a with a uh, with a large backend storage. Uh, but yeah, he it, says uh, the droplets don't let you choose what to scale. They just have different sizes, yeah. and you can't get a lot of storage in little CPU kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. And so there's, but I have, a, I think I have a couple different ideas for how to how to kind of work around that. But here is his solution. He says, I'd like to try out a challenge of running my own physical server in a colo. But you know, uh, he says, what kind of cost should I be prepared to see? Uh, I'd like to only need, I hopefully only need three U's and maybe six terabytes of traffic a month. Uh, if I did a full monthly backup to another location, it appears that Alan is very experienced with this and maybe could offer me some advice. I want to, con I want to have control over my data with the server, host my own mail, store my own offsite backups. I've tried using a family member's house as offsite B VPN, but with limited bandwidth, it didn't work so well. Thanks for the insights, mm -hmm. Ryan. So the biggest problem with Colo is that you're almost always looking at a one-year or three-year contract, mm. uh, and bandwidth most likely won't be in terabytes. It will be 95th percentile. So they measure how much... Uh, how many megabits you've used every five minutes. 
or how many, how many megabits you're using on average every five minutes. And then they delete the top 5% of that, the top, the most busy 36 hours of the month, and charge you for what your most usage was except for that top 5%. So if you're doing, you know, 100 megabits constantly during your backup and then almost nothing the rest of the month, if your backup's more than 36 hours, you pay for a hundred, whole 100 megabits all the time. So that can be a little difficult. Um, there's the medium option, which is a dedicated server, where you're renting the hardware from somebody. Uh, those generally do come with uh, terabytes of traffic, so usually 10 or so. Uh, and you can get them with a lot of storage, although getting with very large amounts of storage, like more than four or six terabytes usually, uh, basically more than two hard drives uh, in them is usually more expensive um, because disks are expensive. The advantage with a dedicated server is if a hard drive dies, they have to replace it, usually with an SLA that says it will replace it within, you know, four hours or 24 hours or whatever. Uh, whereas if it's your co-located servers, you have to, you know, get the replacement drive and then take it to the data center and put it in and, and all that. Um, and, you know, they have to deal with failed power supplies and all the problems become their problem instead of your problem. Uh, and it gives you more choices of locations, you know. Uh, Co-location, you usually almost always are going to go someplace local, whereas with a dedicated server, you can be like, I want my server to be in Amsterdam or Singapore or whatever, right? But oftentimes you want it close to home anyway because you'll get better transfer speeds that way. Uh, so the advantage of the dedicated server is you can usually get that on a month-to-month -month contract, uh, which would be better than co-location, and you get the uh, more user-friendly bandwidth billing of so many terabytes of usage as opposed to uh, 91st percentile based on mm -hmm. having enough capacity to support your usage. Mm -hmm. uh, but co-location can work. Um, if you've got the money. Especially if you find a local place. But Local's um, nice too if you have to work on the rig. Yeah. Uh, the downside there usually is there aren't that many places that offer a specific number of views because if you did that, you have to have some restrictions on access to it. Otherwise, you know, I can press the power button on the server beside mine. Yeah. Right, so normally you're talking about they rent uh, fractional cabinets. So uh, you know a 42U rack is this tall, and they can split. They sell it as a whole rack, half a rack, or a quarter of a rack. If you're getting a quarter of a rack, you have about 10 U's of space. And uh, you know paying for 10 U's of space for a one three U server doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, you know what I have in Portland is uh, you know a friend of a friend and a bunch of people got together and between the group of us, we rent one rack. Uh, the downside there obviously is, you know, people come and go or whatever. And then all of a sudden uh, there's not as many people as there used to be to split the bill between and yeah. it's getting more expensive. Right. And, right. And you have to keep your server there. Now you're hooked. Yeah. yeah. All right, Alan, that was a great answer. If you'd like to send your question, text snap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or use the contact form on the site. Just click the contact link or the subreddit text snap dot reddit dot com we love your questions send them in we need them all up because we just read a whole batch because we recorded two episodes in a row of them and so we are ready we're hungry for your questions send them in and we'll read them on a future episode of the tech snap program and now with the emails all done that means it's time for the tech snap roundup Welcome to the Tech Snap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the roundup of stories that just didn't fit at the top of the show, but we still want to give you some links to follow up on your own after the show. And a lot of these links came from our fantastic subreddit over at techsnap.reddit.com. And Alan, this uh, first story is a pretty big story today. It broke yesterday as we were mm -hmm. recording this, and it's this. Uh, it's being called an international cybercrime marketplace. Some people say it's like Silk Road for uh, for malware. That's why I heard I heard that comparison on NPR today. Uh, but it was uh -huh. called Dark Code, Code with a K, so Dark mm -hmm. Code. we got a lot of stuff spelled with Ks in this episode, don't we? I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, so International Cybercrime Marketplace has been taken down, and it looks like it was a joint operation between the Department of Justice uh, and other uh, international, I don't really know all the different international agencies, but other 28 other agencies or something like that. Um, something crazy. But what do you think, Alan? Dark code, another marketplace. Is this becoming news now in these websites? Because there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these. Why is this news, do you think? Um, I don't know. Uh, Krebs has an article about it as well on his website. Uh, Does he scratch something inside out of, of it? it? Yeah. Uh, he mostly just talks about how, they how you know it's been going on for about eight years, and uh, of course Krebs knows the people behind it and has all the details on them. Uh, but apparently, it was run by a 36-year-old Slovenian hacker. Uh, and, uh, you know, was out there to sell exploits. 
Uh, it was funny because I was actually looking at a, a website just the other day. Uh, I forget the name of it now, but they had a big list of exploits, and most of them were free, but they had a bunch that actually they mm-hmm. charged money for mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. I, uh, Binar in the chat room says Krebs is a follower of theirs for a while, so they they are yes. one of the more well known ones. That sounds like it for sure. Uh, I love the uh, image Krebs has on his website of the forum. Yeah. Uh, and at the top, under the, the sell category, it's just like, Welcome to Dark Code, the international marketplace for sewing machines and other legal stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just looking at it there, uh, eBay shipping services, uh, WHMCS, which is a web hosting management control panel, uh, zero day exploit, um, data birth, and uh, full info with SSNs for people, mm. uh, offline point of sales hack. Selling 1.2 thousand FTP accounts, selling Ooh. Skype accounts, Ooh. access to all Limehost semi BP uh, data center, Ooh. discount coupons for stuff, random things. Hmm. I uh, yeah the dark yeah the dark code fiber cybercrime forum up close cool nice post Mr Krebs, Alan mm-hmm. we have uh, another roundup item about the, the an interview with the creator of Pearl Six. Yes. Uh, so Larry Wall, who started Pearl, and I uh, was talking a bit about Pearl 6, which uh, we've been threatened with since, uh, like, the year 2000, hmm. something like that. They say 15 years <laughs> in the making. Yeah, it's been 15 years in the making uh, for Pearl 6, and talking about actually making that happen, and also talking more about teaching kids to code and stuff. And I think uh, the perspective of somebody who actually writes a, a language uh, is hmm. an interesting perspective yeah. on the concept of teaching kids how to code. Uh, Pearl's an interesting one because it's, a, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> uh, TechSnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com for your feedback. I thought this next one was uh, an eye roller. Mm. So Google yes. has a new photos app that uh, automatically will upload your photos uh, in the background when you're on Wi-Fi and uh, save them on the Google servers. So it's sort of like a photo backup, and then it does touches and mm. touches them up and stuff like that. Well, if you installed it and then decided maybe you didn't want it and then uninstalled the program, mm-hmm. doesn't stop it from uploading. It, it, it adds a service to the operating system, and that service continues to upload your photos to Google even after you remove the app from and your phone. And it doesn't get uninstalled when you remove the app. Yeah. That's a bit hinky. Yeah. Uh, although the biggest complaint I've heard mostly is a uh, friend in the UK finds that just his internet connection can't handle it. So every time somebody comes home and and their iPhone starts uploading, or their phone starts uploading photos, uh, it just completely murders his internet connection. <laughs> like he gets, uh, you know, huge sad, thing, high packet loss that's and can't sad. use Mumble properly oh, anymore. Wow. Oh, wow, that's sad, though. That's too bad. Uh, it's not that he has an overly slow internet connection. It's just the quality of service setup or whatever. It's just yeah. his, the phone is just using all of the bandwidth. Um, and if you want to turn it off in the meantime, I think they're going to update this. But in the meantime, if you go into your on your Android device, go to Google Settings, and then select Google, F- Google Photos Backup and toggle the switch to off. Uh, you, and then that'll turn that off, even if you have the app still on. There's also switches in there to control when it backs up. Um, I think mine's set up so it only backs up when it's actually plugged in as well. Because mm, mm-hmm. uh, it's like, yes, I'm on Wi-Fi, but... If I'm on Wi-Fi and not plugged in, it's probably because I'm not at home. Please don't use other people's Wi-Fi to upload photos. Yeah, that's nice. That's a nice, yeah, that's a good... Don't lag the conference Wi-Fi, please. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, gosh, no kidding. Uh, Okay, I love this one because it's 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 an SSD story. OZZ has a new series of drives. Yeah, so OZZ went out of business kind of and and Toshiba bought them and and is bringing them back to life with a discount brand of SSDs that are TLC or triple level cells uh, Hmm. and they're... Available for forty cents per gigabyte on sizes up to nine hundred and sixty gigs, oh. uh, wow. and they're fifty cents a gigabyte for the small sizes. Hmm. But uh, four hundred eighty, nine hundred sixty gigs, and so on, and forty cents a gig. Uh, and they use a brand new flash memory and uh, new flash controller directly from Toshiba. So you can uh, get so six so six, nine hundred sixty gigabyte drive is three hundred and sixty bucks on Amazon, and a four hundred and eighty yeah. gigabyte drive is one hundred and eighty bucks on Amazon. Right, so that's in the forty cents per gigabyte range, that's, and that is really most good. SSDs we've been seeing is all, uh, only just getting below a dollar now. So that's a kind of a big difference there. Um, but a, a totally new type of flash and a totally new flash controller. Mm. It's like, mm, but Toshiba's pretty good. But then they're launching it under the OCZ brand, and and they don't have a good reputation for reliability with SSDs. Yeah. Um, so mostly. 
It sounds interesting, but I'm going to wait for the second generation <laughs> before I rush out and buy these. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Uh, I like this next Krebs story we have in the roundup. Just as a quick over, it's 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 interesting how one man, a uh, 25 year old man uh, in Vietnam, uh, has now right, gone so we to started covering years in this. prison. Yeah, yeah. So we started covering the story a long time ago when we found out about it. But basically, he ran a website where he sold soul identities. For like, and it turned uh, out he was buying them directly from Experian. He, and, yeah, and it was like, like 200 million people are affected in this. Like, it was some serious, yeah. huge number, So right? he basically pretended to be a private detective or whatever and exploiting some company that Experian ended up buying or something. But it wasn't technically Experian. It was a company that they bought, yeah, but it, was it like continued a, after, even right. after they bought them. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this guy basically bought identities directly from... Uh, the identity theft protection company, and then he could even he would allow, then he set up a site if you remember, and he let people go like search for people's information, and you could buy individuals' yep. information and stuff. So he kind of yeah, yeah. And uh, but he got grabbed up by the U.S. and brought to the states for trial, and has been sentenced to thirteen, 13 years, years for running the ID theft service. Yeah. Uh, so that's good to see. Although you know it'd be nice to see Experian get slapped for exactly. that one as well. That's what I was thinking too. Uh, it's like you're, you're you're supposed to be the credit monitoring uh, the credit agency and supposed to be offering monitoring service and instead you're selling my identity directly to the bad guys yeah. for cash alright Alan the next story in the roundup when security and politics collide in the light of the OPM breach what do we have here yeah so this is talking about the lifespan of a senior executive service person in the US government mm -hmm. and basically asking you know were the security problems at uh, the OPM really the fault of the person who was in charge and, you know, they, they were going to stick around and they got fired and they replaced them. And it's like, but is that going to make any difference? You know, how much of this is a security problem and how much of this is a political problem? Yeah. And the answer is a lot of both. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one, uh, one is blocking the other a lot of times, too. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's a fairly interesting read. So I recommend that one. Brace yourself. Ars Technica is saying the death of the TikTok cycle until it confirms it's shattering it with the uh, Lake K what is it Cabby Lake Cabby Cabby Lake Cabby, Cabby Lake Cabby, processors, uh, and they're yeah. also uh, the company is going to make three generations of fourteen nanometer processors, delaying the switch to ten nanometers. They've announced. Yeah, so normal the the um, the Intel process is a tick where they shrink the die, and then a talk where they keep the original the same size die but make the processor better. And then they do a tick and they shrink and talk. But they had quite a few problems with Broadwell, if you remember. So when they shrunk uh, for Broadwell, uh, they had problems. And then so that caused a lot of delays. And then Skylake is what's going to come out next as planned. But the, d the shrink from 14 to 10 nanometers is taking longer than expected. Mm -hmm. uh, so they pushed that into 2017. Yeah. And in 2016, we will get these KB Lake processors. Um, Intel plans to get back to TikTok, so, um, and they they still have a goal of uh, the complete refresh every two years, um, but it's more interesting that it might be the first time that Moore's Law falters, right? Uh, Moore's Law was a law that came up by one of the guys that founded Intel saying, you know, that the we'll be able to double the number of transistors on a CPU yeah. every 18 to 24 months, right. and this is the first time that hasn't been true. Uh, mostly because of just complications. Uh, you know, once you get, you're getting really small now and, and doubling every time is, you know, you're getting diminishing returns a little bit. Yeah, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if we're going to see another slip in a little while or if this will be the last slip for a bit. We'll see. It really depends. Uh, separately, IBM has demoed a 7 nanometer process, mm -hmm. but they've kind of shown that it worked in a lab, not in production, and it's unclear whether it's actually viable yeah. or not. Intel mass produces these things at an amazing quantity. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm slightly more interested in the adding of features and stuff rather than the die shrinks necessarily anyway. Yeah, so. I'm with you. Um, I realize they get better power. You yeah, know, so and better and power uh, is useful, but uh, yeah, you know. The, the way forward might be doing more work with what we have, you know, things like the AESNI and the AVX and all mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. uh, that maybe we can get a lot more performance out of the existing chips. Yeah, I'm ready for a dozen cores. I agree I agree with CleverWise. Oh, they already have a dozen cores. I know, but things. I want them in just my regular laptop chips. I'm sick of like four cores in a laptop. Yeah. I want all the cores, Alan. I want all the cores. 128 cores in I a laptop. I only got like, but 
eight. 32 cores in my new machine. <laughs> All right, well, that brings us to the end of the TaxNap program. Uh, we'd love to have you join us live. Why don't you come over to jblive.tv? We do this show live at 1 p.m. Pacific, which is... 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Pow. JupiterBroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that converted to your local time zone. JBLive.info for the audio-only streams. RSS feeds are over at the website. Just go find the uh, episode and uh, scroll down past the download links. Boop, boop, boop. Feeds are in there. Links to everything we talked about, resources, etc. papers for the source material. All of that is linked in the show notes. And TechSnap comes out every single week. So if you grab the RSS feed, then you just get us auto magically and if you join us live you get to hang out with us during the live breaks uh you know between segments you get to help title the show you get to poke at alan sometimes and ask him what kind of keyboard he has which he loves that question all the time and uh all the other fun things that we do only for the live audience and on days like this when we're recording a double session it really is quite a marathon but uh, we'll be yes. back at our regular live time next week so join us over at jblive.tv all right everybody thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of TechSnap. we'll see you right back here next week <laughs>